Hello, thank you for joining me today. We've been reading A Course of Miracles, and today we are reading from the main text, chapter 12, The Holy Spirit's Curriculum. There are eight sections in this chapter, and uh, I, I expect we won't finish this chapter in one sitting. So we're starting with section one of chapter 12, the Holy Spirit's curriculum. Section one is the judgment of the Holy Spirit. You have been told not to make error real. And the way to do this is very simple. If you want to believe in error, you would have to make it real because it is not true. But truth is real in its own right. And to believe in truth, you do not have to do anything. Understand that you do not respond to anything directly, but to your interpretation of it. Your interpretation thus becomes the justification for the response. That is why analyzing the motives of others is hazardous to you. If you decide that someone is really trying to attack you, or desert you, or enslave you, you will respond as if he had actually done so having made his error real to you. To interpret error is to give it power, and having done this, you will overlook truth. The analysis of ego motivation is very complicated, very obscuring, and never without your own ego involvement. The whole process represents a clear-cut attempt to demonstrate your own ability to understand what you perceive. This is shown by the fact that you react to your interpretations as if they were correct. You may then control your reactions behaviorally, but not emotionally. This would be a split or an attack on the integrity of your mind, pitting one level against the other. There is but one interpretation of motivation that makes any sense, and because it is the Holy Spirit's judgment, it requires no effort at all on your part. Every loving thought is true. Everything else is an appeal for healing and help, regardless of the form it takes. Can anyone be justified in responding with anger to a brother's plea for help? No response can be appropriate except the willingness to give it to him. For this, and only this, is what he is asking for. Offer him anything else, and, I, and you are assuming the right to attack his reality by interpreting it as you see fit. Perhaps the danger of this to your own mind is not yet fully apparent. If you believe that an appeal for help is something else. You will react to something else. Your response will therefore be inappropriate to reality as it is, but not to your perception of it. There is nothing to prevent you from recognizing all calls for help as exactly what they are, except your own imagined need to attack. It is only this that makes you willing to engage in endless battles with reality in which you deny the reality of the need for healing by making it unreal. You would not do this except for your unwillingness to accept reality as it is and which you therefore withhold from yourself. It is surely good advice to tell you not to judge what you do not understand. No one with a personal investment is a reliable witness, for truth to him has become what he wants it to be. If you are therefore, if you are unwilling to perceive an appeal for help as what it is, it is because you are unwilling to give help and to receive it. To fail to recognize a call for help is to refuse help. Would you maintain that you do not need it? Yet this is what you are maintaining when you refuse to recognize a brother's appeal 
for only and for only by answering his appeal can you be helped deny him your help and you will not recognize god's answer to you the holy spirit does not need your help in interpreting motivation but you do need his only appreciation is an appropriate response to your brother gratitude is due him for both his loving thoughts and his appeals for help for both are capable of bringing love into your awareness if you perceive them truly and all your sense of strain comes from your attempts not to do just this how simple then is god's plan for salvation there is but one response to reality for reality invokes evokes no conflict at all there is but one response to reality for re <laughs> i'm reading it again for reality evokes no conflict of all there is but one teacher of reality who understands what it is he does not change his mind about reality because reality does not change Although your interpretations of reality are meaningless in your divided state, his remain consistently true. He gives them to you because they are for you. Do not attempt to help a brother in your way, for you cannot help yourself. But hear his call for the help of God, and you will recognize your own need for the Father. Your interpretations of your brother's need are your interpretations of yours. By giving help, you are asking for it, and if you perceive but one need in yourself, you will be healed. For you will recognize God's answer as you want it to be, and if you want it in truth, it will be truly yours. Every appeal you answer in the name of Christ brings the remembrance of your Father closer to your awareness. For the sake of your need, then, hear every call for help as what it is, so God can answer you. By applying the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the reactions of others more and more consistently, you will gain and increasing awareness that his criteria are equally applicable to you. For to recognize fear is not enough to escape from it, although the recognition is necessary to demonstrate the need for escape. The Holy Spirit must still translate the fear into truth. If you were left with the fear once you had recognized it, you would have taken a step away from reality, not towards it. Yet we have repeatedly emphasized the need to recognize fear and face it without disguise as a crucial step in the undoing of the ego. Consider how well the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the motives of others will serve you then. Having taught you to accept only loving thoughts in others and to regard everything else as an appeal for help, he has taught you that fear itself is an appeal for help. This is what recognizing fear really means. If you do not protect it, he will reinterpret it. This is the ultimate value in learning to perceive attack as a call for love. We have already learned that fear and attack are inevitably associated. If only attack produces fear, and if you see attack as the call for help that it is, the unreality of fear must be drawn to you, must dawn on you, rather, for fear is a call for love in unconscious recognition of what has been denied. I want to read a couple of those sentences again. We have already learned that fear and attack are inevitably associated. If only attack produces fear, and if you see attack as the call for the help that it is, the unreality of fear must dawn on you, for fear is a call 
for love in unconscious recognition of what has been denied. Fear is a symptom of your own deep sense of loss. If when you perceive it in others, you learn to supply the loss, the basic cause of fear is removed. Thereby you teach yourself that fear does not exist in you. The means for removing it is in yourself and you have demonstrated this by giving it. Fear and love are the only emotions of which you are capable. One is false for it is made out of denial and denial depends on the belief in what is denied for its own existence. By interpreting fear correctly as a positive affirmation of the underlying belief it masks, you are undermining its perceived usefulness by rendering it useless. Defenses that do not work at all are automatically discarded. If you raise that what fear conceals to clear-cut, unequivocal, unequivocal predominance, fear becomes meaningless. You have denied its power to conceal love, which was its only purpose. The veil that you have drawn across the face of love has disappeared. If you would look upon love, which is the world's reality, how could you do better than to recognize in every defense against it the underlying appeal for it? And how could you better learn of its reality than by answering the appeal for it by giving it? The Holy Spirit's interpretation of fear does dispel it, for the awareness of truth cannot be denied. Thus does the Holy Spirit replace fear with love and translate error into truth. And thus will you learn of him how to replace your dream of separation with the fact of unity. For the separation is the only denial of union and correctly interpreted, attests to your eternal knowledge that union is true. Chapter 12, The Holy Spirit's Curriculum, Section 2, The Way to Remember God. Miracles are merely the translation of denial into truth. If to love oneself is to heal oneself, those who are sick do not love themselves. Therefore, they are asking for the love that would heal them, but which they are denying to themselves. If they knew the truth about themselves, they could not be sick. The task of the miracle worker thus becomes to deny the denial of truth. The sick must heal themselves, for the truth is in them. Yet having obscured it, the light in another mind must shine into theirs because the, that light is theirs. The light in them shines as brightly regardless of the density of the fog that obscures it. If you give no power to the fog to obscure the light, it has none. For it has power only if the Son of God gives power to it. He must con he must himself withdraw that power, remembering that all power is of God. You can remember this for all the sonship. Do not allow your brother not to remember, for his forgetfulness is yours. But your remembering is his, for God cannot be remembered alone. This is what you have forgotten. To perceive the healing of your brother as the healing of yourself is thus the way to remember God. For you forgot your brothers with him, and God's answer to your forgetting is but the way to remember. Perceive in sickness but another call for love, 
and offer your brother what he believes he cannot offer himself. Whatever the sickness, there is but one remedy. You will be made whole as you make whole, for to perceive in sickness the appeal for health is to recognize in hatred the call for love. And to give a brother what he really wants is to offer it unto yourself, for your father wills you to know your brother as yourself. Answer his call for love, and yours will be answered. Healing is the love of Christ for his father and for himself. Remember what was said about the frightening perceptions of little children, which terrify them because they do not understand them. If they ask for enlightenment and accept it, their fears vanish. But if they hide their nightmares, they will keep them. It is easy to help an uncertain child, for he recognizes that he does not understand what his perceptions mean. Yet you believe that you do understand yours. Little child, you are hiding your head under the cover of the heavy blankets you have laid upon yourself. You are hiding your nightmares in the darkness of your own false certainty and refusing your eyes, refusing to open your eyes and look at them. Let us not save nightmares, for they are not fitting offerings for Christ, and so they are not fit gifts for you. Take off the covers and look at what you are afraid of. Only the anticipation will frighten you, for the reality of nothingness cannot be frightening. Let us not delay this, for your dream of hatred will not leave you without help, and help is here. Learn to be quiet in the midst of turmoil, for quietness is the end of strife, and this is the journey to peace. Look straight at every image that arises to delay you, for the goal is inevitable because it is eternal. The goal of love is but your right, and it belongs to your, you despite your dreams. You still want what God wills, and no nightmare can defeat a child of God in his purpose. For your purpose was given you by God, and you must accomplish it, because it is his will. Awake and remember your purpose, for it is your will to do so. What has been accomplished for you must be yours. Do not let your hatred stand in the way of love, for nothing can withstand the love of Christ for his Father or his Father's love for him. A little while, and you will see, for I am not hidden, because you are hiding. I will awaken you as surely as I awakened myself, for I awoke for you. In my resurrection is your release. Our mission is to escape from crucifixion, not from redemption. Trust in my help, for I will not walk alone, and I will walk with you as your father, as our father walked with me. Do you not know that I walked with him in peace? And does that not mean that peace goes with us on the journey? There is no fear in perfect love. We will but be making perfect to you what is already perfect in you. You do not fear the unknown, but the known. You will not fail in your mission because I did not fail in mine. Give me but a little trust in the name of the complete trust I have in you, and we will easily accomplish the goal of perfection together. For perfection is and cannot be denied. To deny the denial of perfection is not so difficult as to deny the truth. And what we can accomplish together will be believed when you see it as accomplished. You who have tried to banish love have not succeeded, but you who chose to banish fear must succeed. The Lord is with you but you know it not. 
yet your Redeemer liveth and abideth in you, in the peace out of which he was created. Would you not exchange this awareness for the awareness of fear when you have overcome, not by hiding it, not by minimizing it, and not by denying it in its full import in any way? This is what you will really see. You cannot lay aside the obstacles to real vision without looking upon them, for to lay aside means to judge against. If you will look, the Holy Spirit will judge truly. Yet he cannot shine away that you keep yet he cannot shine away what you keep hidden, for you have not offered it to him, and he cannot take it from you. We are therefore embarking on an organized, well structured, and carefully planned program aimed at learning how to offer to the Holy Spirit everything you do not want. He knows what to do with it. You do not understand how to use what he knows. Whatever is given him that is not of God is gone. Yet you must look at it yourself in perfect willingness, for otherwise his knowledge remains useless to you. Surely he will not fail to help you, since help is his only purpose. Do you not have greater reason for fearing the world as you perceive it than for looking at the cause of fear and letting it go forever? Chapter 12, The Holy Spirit's Curriculum, Section 3, The Investment in Reality. I think this will be, we'll close with this section uh, today. I'm sure you heard uh, my little dog walking around in the background there for a while and whining, I apologize. Um, so I think we'll do one more section and then we'll wrap it up for today. So here we are, section three, the investment in reality. I once asked you to sell all you have and give to the poor and follow me. This is what I meant. If you have no investment in anything in this world, you can teach the poor where their treasure is. The poor are merely those who have invested wrongly and they are poor indeed. Because they are in need, it is given you to help them, since you are among them. Consider how perfectly your lesson would be learned if you were unwilling to share their poverty. For poverty is lack, and there is but one lack, since there is but one need. Suppose a brother insists on having you do something you think you do not want to do. His very insistence should tell you that he believes salvation lies in it. If you insist on refusing and experience a quick response of opposition, you are believing that your salvation lies in not doing it. You, then, are making the same mistake he is and are making his error real to both of you. Insistence means investment. And what you invest in is always related to your notion of salvation. The question is always twofold. First, what is to be saved? And second, how can it be saved? Whenever you become angry with a brother, for whatever reason, you are believing that the ego is to be saved and to be saved by attack. If he attacks, you are agreeing with this belief, and if you attack, you are reinforcing it. Remember that those who attack are poor. Their poverty asks for gifts, not for further impoverishment. You who could help them are surely acting destructively if you accept their poverty as yours. If you had not invested as they had, it would never occur to you to overlook their need. Recognize what does not matter, and if your brothers ask you for something outrageous, do it because it does not matter. 
refuse and your opposition establishes that it does matter to you. It is only you, therefore, who have made the request outrageous, and every request of a brother is for you. Why would you insist on denying him? For to do so is to deny yourself and to impoverish both. He is asking for salvation, as you are. Poverty is of the ego and never of God. No outrageous requests can be made of one who recognizes what is valuable and wants to accept nothing else. Salvation is for the mind, and it is attained through peace. This is the only thing that can be saved and the only way to save it. Any response other than a, a love arises from confusion about the what and the how of salvation. And this is the only answer. Never lose sight of this and never allow yourself to believe, even for an instant, that there is another answer. For you will surely place yourself among the poor who do not understand that they dwell in abundance and that salvation is come. To identify with the ego is to attack yourself and make yourself poor. That is why everyone who identifies with the ego feels deprived. What he experiences then is depression or anger because what he did was to exchange self-love for self-hate, making him afraid of himself. He does not realize this. Even if he is fully aware of anxiety, he does not perceive its source as his own ego identification and he always tries to handle it by making some sort of insane arrangement with the world. He always perceives this world as outside himself, for this is crucial to his adjustment. He does not realize that he makes this world, for there is no world outside of him. If the only loving thoughts of God's Son are the world's reality, the real world must be in his mind. His insane thoughts, too, must be in his mind, but an internal conflict of this magnitude he cannot tolerate. A split mind is in endangered, and the recognition that it encompasses completely opposed thoughts within itself is intolerable. Therefore, the mind projects the split, not the reality. Everything you perceive as outside the world is merely your attempt to maintain your ego identification, for everyone believes that identification is salvation. Yet consider what has happened, for thoughts do have consequences to the thinker. You have become at odds with the world as you perceive it, because you think it is antagonistic to you. This is a necessary consequence of what you have done. You have projected outward what is antagonistic to what is inward, and therefore you would have to perceive it this way. That is why you must realize that your hatred is in your mind and outside and not outside. <laughs> Sorry, let's start that again. Um, that is why you must realize that your hatred is in your mind and not outside it before you can get rid of it, and why you must get rid of it before you can perceive the world as it really is. I said before that God so loved the world that he gave it to his only begotten son. God does love the real world, and those who perceive it, perceive its reality, cannot see the world of death. For death is not of the real world in which everything reflects the eternal. God gave you the real world in exchange for the one you made out of your split mind, and which is the symbol of death. For you, for if you could really separate yourself from the mind of God, you would die. The world you perceive is a world of separation. Perhaps you are willing to accept even death to deny your father. 
yet he would not have it so, and so it is not so. You still cannot will against him, and that is why you have no control over the world you made. It is not a world of will, because it is governed by the desire to be unlike God, and this desire is not will. The world you made is therefore totally chaotic, governed by arbitrary and senseless laws, and without meaning of any kind. For it is made out of what you do not want, projected from your mind because you are afraid of it. Yet this world is only in the mind of its maker, along with his real salvation. Do not believe it is outside of yourself. For only by recognizing where it is will you gain control over it. For you do have control over your mind, since the mind is the mechanism of decision. If you will recognize that all attack you perceive is in your own mind and nowhere else, you will have at last placed its source, and where it begins it must end. For in this same place also lies salvation. The altar of God where Christ abideth is there. You have defiled the altar, but not the world. Yet God placed, yet Christ placed, try that again, yet Christ has placed the atonement on the altar for you. Bring your perceptions of the world to this altar, for it is the altar to truth. There you will see your vision changed, and there you will learn to see truly. From this place where God and his Son dwell in peace, and where you are welcome, you will look out in peace and behold the world truly. Yet to find the place, you must relinquish your investment in the world as you project it, allowing the Holy Spirit to extend the real world to you from the altar of God. So we'll pause here in this chapter 12. It is interesting if you are doing both the uh, Sunday or, or whenever you're reading them, the main text, and if you're also doing the daily lessons, the daily lessons that I just was doing, uh, one of them was, um, uh, I'm not going to remember it now, but it relates totally to this. The world I see holds nothing that I want. That was the lesson. Um, I did remember it. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that there, that there were kind of uh, in parallel, uh, which just is uh, the universe working its magic, I think. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know how that could work any other way. Um, so we will finish uh, lesson or chapter 12 uh, with the next reading. And uh, if you have questions or if you need to reach out, you want some additional support, uh, I am here. Uh, you can message me or uh, text me, 907-351-3003, and uh, I will either see you for the next daily lesson or when we do the next chapter reading um, of, from chapter 12, which will be next Sunday. Thank you again for joining me. Namaste.